here we are together. We'll live. Let's work. I'm gonna work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm gonna work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. Let's see, we lived, we worked. Uh, what's love? I'm gonna love so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm gonna work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. Oh, it's a wonderful day to be together, even all across the world. Here we are. What about, let's see, there's a song that says, he came down that we might have love. Like this. Let's see how he said it. Um, he came down that we might have love. He came down that we might have love. He came down that we might have love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah forever. Oh, my apologies to my uh, sisters who don't say hallelujah during Lent. Maybe we'll just do one more song. One more of those. What a joy. What about this? Oh, he came down that we might have joy. He came down that we might have joy. He came down that we might have joy. Hallelujah forevermore. What about hope? He came down that we might have hope. He came down that we might have hope. He came down that we might have hope. Hallelujah forever. More. I just want to check the time. What about, why don't we sing um, Walk in the Light of God? Now, this is kind of hard to do while we're sitting. But we'll just pretend. So it's so. walk in the light, walk in the light, walk in the light, walking in the light of God. That's a little too low. Let's go up here, maybe like this. Walk in the light, walk in the light, walk in the light, walking in the light of God. And then walk, walk, walk. Walk, walking in the light of God. Walk, 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 walking in the light of God. So we're sitting down. Uh, can we sway? Why don't we sway? Sway in the light, sway in the light, sway in the light, swaying in the light of God. <laughs> sway, 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 sway in the light of God. Sway, 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 sway to the light of God. What about clap? Clap in the light, clap in the light, clap in the light, clapping in the light of God. Clap, 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 clapping in the light of God. Clap, 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 clapping in the light of God. Together, so you could call us some things we can do in the light of God. What about live? Live in the light, live in the light, live in the light, live it in the light of God. Live, 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 live it in the light of God. Live, 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 live it in the light of God. Now we can also love, right? Love in the light, love in the light, love in the light, loving in the light of God. Love, 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 loving in the light of God. Love, 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 loving in the light of God. Let's see. What about Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. Amen. Before we begin, we just want to welcome you and to remind you to turn on uh, your interpreters, your preferred language. We would like for you to make, make sure that you are turning on your preferred language in uh, the bottom part of your screen. Welcome. Un anuncio para los hispanohablantes y las hispanohablantes. Abajo en la barra del menú hay un icono con un globo y allí pueden escoger española o el idioma preferido. Gracias. Un anuncio para los participantes francófonos. Nos vous rappelons que hay una traducción simultánea disponible y que vous pouvez choisir la langue que vous allez écouter en seleccionant le canal désiré en bas à droite de votre écran. Gostaria de, de lembrar que os participantes que quiserem escolher a língua portuguesa, que selecione o globo abaixo da tela e indique a opção pelo português como tradução. I want 
with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. From every part of the world, from every area, from every virtual space, we are gathered in this place. Bless us now. Amen. In my hand, I hold on to my sister as she flees her spouse whose anger turns violent without warning. In her hand, she holds on to our sister as she gathers with the other women in her community, plotting a path to safety out of the path of war. In her hand, she holds onto her sisters as she waits in her car for the violent protesters to clear so she can go get the medical attention she needs. <clears throat> in her hand, she holds onto her sisters as she recovers from the genital mutilation she endured at the hands of her family members, done in their eyes to keep her pure and more chaste. In her hand, she holds onto our sibling as they wait in line, hoping to receive approval for their work visa and travel documents, fearing that their disability, gender, class, race, or nationality will be revealed and prevent them to, from, to prevent them from receiving access to freedom or the pathway to a better future. In their hand, they hold on to our sister as she is held in the bondage of slavery, forced to have sex with someone she did not choose just to earn money for her enslaver. In her hand, she holds on to the hand of our sister as she is forced from school each month because of menstruation and is now considered unclean. In her hand, she holds on to her loved one as they receive treatment for a urinary tract infection after not being able to safely access public restroom facilities due to fear of gender-based violence or discrimination. In their hand, they hold on to our sister as she tucks away whatever money she makes or finds in secret places because she has no access to the family accounts and she fears what may happen if she has an emergency. In her hand, she holds onto our sister as she stands in front of a court and is shamed for her wardrobe, her consumption of alcohol, her location, and every life choice she has ever made, also that her rapist may get off the hook for his heinous acts as to not ruin his future. 
In her hand, she holds onto her sibling as they drive through the night across the state lines to get a doctor that provides the reprodu reproductive care they need. In their hand, they hold onto her sisters as she grieves the baby she lost when her partner's abused her, her abuse caused her to miscarry. In her hand, she holds on to our sibling who has been denied the ability to adopt a child by those who think they have the right to define what it means to be a family. In their hand, they hold on to our sister as she is shamed for her sexuality being called a tease, a prude within mere breaths of each other. In her hand, she holds on to our sister as she stars herself trying to feel beautiful. In her hand, she holds on to me as I shame myself for my anxiety and depression, telling myself that I am too busy for self-care or to tend to my own physical, emotional, spiritual needs. We hold on to each other. We circle this world both with our trauma, but also with our love and compassion. We, we heal, heal and, and hope together. together. All holding on together. We indeed are holding on together. You heard the stories, the stories of women in various situations. We heard the stories of sexual violence. You heard the stories of gender mutilation. You heard the stories of anxiety and depression. You heard the stories of uh, child, early forced and early childhood marriage. You heard the stories of domestic violence and access to health care and uh, the denial of uh, reproductive health and rights, uh, human rights, our rights. You heard the plight of women and girls. You heard the plight of those who are in need of a hand, God's hand. God's hand in the hands of one another. Here now, there are so many stories of accompaniment in our texts, in our sacred text and holy text. And this one in this place says this, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But if you and your fathers family will perish and who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this you sisters family my siblings from around the world who have gathered in this sacred space for such a time as this you have gathered you have gathered and you have gathered to say that we will no longer be silent on these issues this is a text from the book of Esther. But if it had not been for Vashti, the queen who said no, the queen who refused to come before the empire, who refused to come before the courts and refused to compromise, if it were not for her, then the hand could not have been extended. The legacy could not have been continued with Esther. And so Esther then takes the mantle and she then, for such a time as it was called, on behalf of our entire community, goes on no matter what. We, family, have come today to just begin this journey during CSW. During this Commission on the Status of Women, we come to not only find out and hear what, 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 the, what people are saying and what the, what what, what we are hearing from governments and what we are hearing from those that are in power, but we've come to hear from God and to hold each other's hands so that we might continue for such a time as this, accompanying one another, journeying together, for we go together, not without our sister, not without the women and girls with whom we are fighting for and with, and not without our family, the family of faith that is coming now. For this time, we go together. 
I want to invite you, if you would, to just lift and put your hands to the screen. We usually receive with one hand and, and we give with another. I want for you to receive a blessing now with this left hand. Lift your left hand, if you would, to the screen. Merciful and gracious God, we've come together as a family of faith and we receive your blessing. We receive your commission to go forth and not be silent on behalf of women and girls uh, all around the world. And God, we lift now our right hand to place it to the screen. And we give our sister, our family, the strength. If we were in, in each other's company physically, we would be able to see and hold each other's hands. But God, with our right hand, we stretch it out and speak life, speak healing, speak hope, speak deliverance, speak freedom and justice to our sisters around the globe and to all those who are gathered in the family of faith to help us, to help us for such a time as this. It is in Jesus' name we pray and say, amen. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we give all praise, glory, and honor to you. We gather with great anticipation for CSW. We gather to change systems, and just as you did for Esther, we ask you to put us in the right place to make those changes. As we gather together to support each other in the change-making process, may we go together to glorify you. We lift these prayers and those that will follow in the precious name of Jesus. And now, Creator God, we pause to remember all those we have lost this past year. During this time of silence, all are encouraged to write in the chat the names of their loved ones who have passed as we continue to pray in silence. The music will bring us back together as we end this time. We take the hands of everyone that is here and we want to remember this is not a time, it is not lost on us at all, that we remember all of those names who have been coming through the chat. We still see them and they are sacred names. They are sacred loved ones. They are sacred parts of all of our community and our family. And we want you to know that we are praying stretching our hands over every one of those names. Thank you for joining us and being here. I, I just want to say one thing before we officially welcome you to this space. 
that this choir is the choir of people who have come from all of our delegations joining us. We now have so many more people that are joining us this morning and don't have the, the privilege of knowing how absolutely wonderful and gifted we all are because you have not necessarily journeyed with us all these years, but we come together, we come together. So I'm so grateful for this amazing choir that has been put together, volunteers from our delegations. And we thank God for you, Grace, uh, Grace Hugh Hubbard, who is our music director. We thank you. All of you who are gathered, I want you to know that ecumenical women is grounded in our faith and commitment to global justice. We train and we empower uh, our expanding network to advocate for gender equality at the United Nations. That's who we are. Our members, ecumenical women, affirm God's preferential option for the marginalized, that God prefers the marginalized and that Jesus has confirmed God, God's will that the world may have life and have it more abundantly. We have a vision and we envision a human community where the participation of each and every one are valued. We, no one is excluded and all are welcome in God's world. The United Nations system is a complex one, but in, at this commission on the status of women each and every year, year when we gather, we meet to promote women's empowerment in the political, the economic, civil, social, and educational fields, and to make recommendations on the urgent problems that are, are concerning all women and girls at every age, at every level. And so I want you to know that you are already an, a witness. You are already a voice for the marginalized and you are already an advocate. We've come together to hold each other's hand and go forth together. Now, take a look and see just a little bit of who we all are. Our delegations, we present them to you, ecumenical women at the UN. Greetings from the Lutheran World Federation, a global communion of 148 churches in the Lutheran tradition, representing over 77 million Christians in 99 countries. We are old. In 2017, we commemorated 500 years of the Reformation. Our humanitarian and development work reaches more than 2 million refugees and displaced people in 28 countries. As founding members of Ecumenical Women at the UN, we are fully committed to gender justice. Our gender justice policy affirms our belief that we are created equal in the image of God and we should all strive to eliminate discrimination. The National Council of Churches of Christ is proud to be a friend of Ecumenical Women. Since 1950, NCC has served as a leading voice of witness to the living Christ. NCC unites a diverse covenant community of 38 member communions and over 40 million individuals, 100,000 congregations from Protestant, Anglican, Orthodox, Evangelical, Historic African American, and Living Peace traditions in a common commitment to advocate for and represent God's love and promise of unity in our public square. My denomination, American Baptist Churches, is one of the member communions. We are deeply grateful to be part of Ecumenical Women, collaborating with partners of faith working to end gender discrimination and seeking the advancement of women and girls. Will you join us? Thank you. Presbyterian Church USA is a mainline Protestant denomination, a part of the Reformed tradition. It is the largest Presbyterian denomination in the United States, with over 1.35 million active members and over 9,000 congregations. Building on the pioneer work and missions that began more than a century ago, today PCUSA works with our global church and community partners, accompanying one another in God's mission to work towards a better world. 
We received our special consultative status with the UN Economic and Social Council back in 1998, and we have been an active member of the ecumenical community here at the UN. We are proud to be one of the founding members of Ecumenical Women, working to advocate for gender justice to fully live out our call in the church and the world. Presbyterian Women in the United States was a friend of Ecumenical Women for numerous years. In 2018, we were delighted to become a member when we received consultative status. Presbyterian Women was formed in 1988 when the women's organizations of two reunited streams of Presbyterians also united. However, our roots are much deeper and extend back more than 230 years. Our purpose best describes us. Forgiven and free by God through Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves to nurture our faith through prayer and Bible study, to support the mission of the church worldwide, to work for justice and peace, and to build an inclusive, caring community of women that strengthens the Presbyterian Church USA and witnesses to the promise of God's kingdom. My name is Mavis Duncanson and I bring you warm greetings from Presbyterian Women, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Our organisation seeks to serve God globally and locally with love. We acknowledge Māori as tangata whenua in Aotearoa, the first peoples of our nation. Presbyterian Women, Aotearoa has enjoyed special consultative status with ECOSOC since 1998 through the foresight of women of faith who were present at Beijing and initiated that process. Our participation in Ecumenical Women is a joyful and wonderful opportunity to work with women and men from around the world as a faith-based organisation, working towards equality, elimination of violence, and full enjoyment of human rights without discrimination of any kind. We like to frame our work using the Global Goals for Sustainable Development, which provide for faith-based organisations as well as others a good, uh, a good outline of what we need for our future as a planet. Warm greetings, Kakite Anu. I am Victoria Edmonds with the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army started in 1865 on the east end of London by William and Catherine Booth. The Salvation Army is a global organization in 131 countries around the world. We are made up of pastors slash officers who are the ministerial team of the Salvation Army. We have employees, we have uh, people who attend our Salvation Army services, which we call soldiers and adherents who recognize the Salvation Army as their church home. And we have volunteers. So we have many, many people around the world who are part of our organization. We are a part of Ecumenical Women because we believe in the equality for each person around the world. And so we want to give our voice in helping to make equality a um, right for everyone. The United Church of Christ is a proud member of Ecumenical Women. The UCC was created through a merger of two denominations in 1957, but our predecessor denominations have a 400 year history. We have nearly 5,000 churches and over 800,000 members in the United States and we partner with around 290 organizations in about 90 countries. Our mission is to work for a just world for all, including working for global gender justice. Hi, I'm Sean Ross of the Women's Missionary Society of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The AME Church operates and serves over 8,000 congregations worldwide in North America, Africa, India, and the Caribbean. The WMS of the AME Church is a connectional international organization, and it also operates in those local congregations worldwide. This is a corporate body, 
in which all women and some men participate to broaden their scope of missions and use their gifts of touching the lives of many people. Our mission calls us to strengthen our faith and share the liberating gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by service and witness to the world. We affirm the mission of ecumenical women for the marginalized in Jesus Christ. Hi, I'm Reverend Nikki Ashwood. I'm Donna Gail Bollinger. And I'm Ryan Smith. We are all staff at the World Council of Churches. As a fellowship of over 350 member churches globally, representing over a half a billion Christians, most of Ecumenical Women's founding organizations are also members of the World Council of Churches. Between our offices in Geneva and New York City, we're committed to advocacy on all global platforms. One of our more popular campaigns is the Thursdays in Black campaign for a world without rape and violence. This is also a campaign that has been endorsed by ecumenical women. We are all actively engaged in ecumenical women. Yes, including me. It takes all of us to end gender-based violence. I am Brenda Smith, United Nations Representative for the World Federation of Methodist and Uniting Church Women, an organization of some 3.5 million women worldwide. I am very pleased to say that we have been an active member of Ecumenical Women for over 25 years, and our esteemed president is Mrs. Allison Judd, the official emblem of the World Federation of Methodist and Uniting Church Women uh, is behind me, and that is the Tree of Life. The tree is an evergreen signifying continuous life and vitality. Its branches stretch upward and outward. The symbols of our thought and action reaching upward to God and outward to our neighbors. My name is Linnea Main, and on behalf of the presiding bishop's delegation of the Episcopal Church and our wider Episcopal presence, we're thrilled to welcome you to UNCSW 65. The Episcopal Church consists of two million members in 17 nations, the United States, several countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, Europe and Asia and the Pacific. We're founding members of EW along with our sister organization, the Anglican Communion, of which we're a member province. We've been at the United Nations since its founding, and we are aware that we build on the work of generations of women who have paved the way before us, that we continue this work in the present, and that we bring with us the future. So we look forward to advocating, praying, participating, worshiping, and continuing this work together. My name is Reverend Dion Boissier, and I'm the current chair of the Ecumenical Women at the United Nations. I also have the honor to be charged by the United Methodist Women to serve as the chaplain of the Church Center for the UN. The Church Center exists to expand the ecumenical community's capacity and access to the United Nations, to bring greater voice to the broad moral and ethical concerns of the Church in international affairs, peacemaking, and advocacy. United Methodist Women is the largest denominational faith organization for women with approximately 800,000 members whose mission is fostering spiritual growth, developing leaders, and advocating for justice. For over 150 years, we have been mobilizing for mission with programs and projects serving women, children, and youth in the United States and in more than 100 countries around the world. We equip women and girls to be global citizens and leaders. We organize for growth. We educate to transform. We serve and advocate, foster spiritual growth, and we embody principles and values that promote empowerment for women, children, and youth, promote anti-racism, multiculturalism, inclusion, equity, fair labor practices, promoting economic and environmental stewardship and sustainability. Our vision is turning faith hope and love into action on behalf of women, children, and youth worldwide. We are one of the proud founding members of the Ecumenical Women at the UN, and we join the coalition to welcome each of you to this year's Commission on the Status of Women and to the Ecumenical Women family. Welcome.
Welcome indeed. We are so grateful to have you. And again, such an, an amazing honor to be able to now let the world see who we are. Now that video was just as few of, of, of our members and our member organizations. We still, uh, we have representation from Church Women United. We have representation from the Anglican Communion, World YWCA, the World Student Christian Federation and Religions for Peace as a collaborator, as well as the World Student Christian Federation. We want you to know that we were born out of the, uh, we were born out of the occasion of the five-year review for the Beijing platform for action. And so that was to enhance and reinforce the collaboration of progressive churches and ecumenical organizations to advocate for the rights of women uh, at, the, uh, at these annual UN Commission on the Status of Women gatherings. Just for you to know, now we're 17 strong NGOs and faith-based organizations working for gender justice. So when we gather, we gather and we gather for worship. First, also, usually we are in all the various places of, of the world now, but we gather in the in the United Nations, uh, the Church Center for the United Nations in our chapel, where we recognize the Lanape um, as the First Nations people and the land that own uh, belong to them. We invite you to do the same wherever you are, every time you begin your worship virtually. And in our worship now, we will cover, just to let you know, the overview of our worship, what we are doing is we are walking together. You see here uh, our theme and so that everyone will know uh, we are walking, we will go together to the glory of God using Judges 4 as our theme using Deborah and Barak and Jael uh, and all those who are journeying together. So you see the first week we come together and what you should know, those of you who are, are will be joining us weekly for morning worship services, we begin at 8 a.m. and we close at 8. Uh, we, we begin at 8, uh, going to 8.30, 30 minutes of power so that we can get ready to do the work that we're called to do. Um, our EW team, worship team, we thank God for you and you are the ones we will start off on Monday, the 15th of March. Together, we will be giving you, letting you know the chat. Uh, I mean, letting you know, I'm sorry, the link, um, please. Email will be your friends, uh, delegates, throughout the time. Also, we will put the, the, the link. Uh, we are uh, streaming on YouTube and our Facebook page. And so, um, please, Presbyterian Women uh, USA and Presbyterian Women will start on Tuesday. Uh, the World Federation will be on Wednesday. The Lutheran World Federation on Thursday and Friday. Our EW team, hopefully, we will also have um, um, other members of our team to join us that day. Monday, the 22nd, the Anglicans and the Episcopal Church will be leading. Church Women United on next week, Tuesday. Wednesday, Salvation Army and the World Council of Churches next week, Thursday as well. And we will close out on the 26th. Again, remember, we will go together. These themes, we will have a meeting on Monday, the 15th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time so that you would be able so that you would be able to join us on the uh, just so you see as uh, here in our virtual spaces, uh, we will need to have things done early. Uh, I know this is a definitely different place and a different uh, uh, a different world that we are in. Uh, and so we want to remind you that 7.30 a.m. we will um, log in for the participants only and worship begins at eight. This is the link for registration and it is open now. Remember the 4, 4 p.m. on Monday for the details with worship planning, where you will send all of your information, the logins, et cetera. And as a people of faith, remember the work doesn't begin when the worship service ends. All of it is advocacy. Worship is advocacy. Our time of care, especially with the review themes that we have uh, this year, they are themes that will trigger. And themes, of course, as we are working for not only women's leadership in the public sphere, but we are also talking about gender-based violence and violence against women and girls. We will need to take care of our souls. And so we will have open uh, Selah space uh, between 12 and two, 
every day. And so this is the Zoom link. We will also send you an email so that your main representat representatives will be able to remind you of it, that you will be joining us for prayer, for reflection, uh, meditation, and just centering because you may need it, we all will. And then our advocacy and social media, we want for all of you to know and follow us. Those of you who are joining us from the outside world, and I say that uh, because you are all also advocates with us. If you would all join us, whenever you post, post the hashtag EWCSW65. EWCSW65. And we are also doing our collaborative event on Thursday with the working group on girls. And we are coming together to talk about the review theme, which is uh, ending gender-based violence. And so we are hearing the voices of our girls speak, to speak up because women and girls are leaders and we, our voices should be heard. And so Thursdays, we're asking everyone to wear black. Now, if you were all gathered with me in, this, in the chapel, which I have the virtual background, I would say to you, repeat after me, what are you wearing on Thursday? Black. What are we wearing on Thursday? Let me see it in the chat. Black. What are you wearing on Thursday? Black. Right. We wear black uh, as, as a, a sign of solidarity and strength. It is Thursdays in black and we stand together with the global community uh, to end all forms of gender-based violence. As you heard our WCC partners to talk to you, members, to share with you that, that, that platform, and we stand together every Thursday wearing black. So the hashtags are there, Thursdays in black, and link up the number two and GBV. These are all the hashtags that we want. And we, our event is happening on the 18th of March, next week, Thursday. We will always be putting all of the information up on our website, I mean, on our website, as well as our Facebook page and all social media outlets and our advocacy gatherings where we come together as a delegation will begin. We'll have one on Wednesday, 17 March at 6 p.m. And so again, more information to come. It's time now not to hear more from me. We need to hear more about those who are standing at the forefront, the leaders um, in our world and in our world for gender based, uh, for gender justice, gender equality. And we are so grateful to be able to have, uh, have you and women joining us as they do every year, um, joining us. And we're asking now, I gotta, I gotta slow down y'all because I have to remember that the interpreters are trying uh, uh, to, to, <laughs> to interpret what I say. I'm just excited that we're all here and we're all gathered together to do this work. So without further ado, I want to call on uh, Victoria Edmonds, who uh, is our treasurer, uh, ecumenical women's treasurer, uh, to come and introduce our executive director of the UN Women now, and that we should then hear a word from her. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I am Victoria Edmonds of the Salvation Army, and I have the wonderful privilege today to bring to you someone who is not new to our, our gathering, who has been with us before, and has a special place in her heart for ecumenical women. Due to this pandemic and all the challenges it has brought to us this year, the video that she wanted to bring to us live couldn't take place this year, but God provides a way. So she will be coming to us by phone. And so I want to present to you the executive director of UN Women, Dr. Pumzili Malungo Nakaka. Welcome to the ecumenical movement, to this CSW, which will deal with the difficult issue of building back better in a gender responsive manner, building back greener and in an equitable form. 
We look forward to your deliberations. What a gift she has always been. And I wish that you all could have been joining us, could have joined us in years past. We have video to prove how energetic she is dancing in the middle of the chapel with us as we worshiped together. Thank you so much uh, for your witness and for your leadership. I have the privilege now that you all, uh, for you all to hear what we have always known and having this amazing woman to be able to join us now as she has every year has just been a gift. Um, we have been able to call her now friend. And so I want to introduce to you all Lopa Banjiri. Banerjee, sorry, the, the Director of Civil Society Division of UN Women. She's also the Director of, uh, she is also now the leading our strategic engagement and partnership development with civil societies organizations to influence global action on gender equality, in particular related to, to the standard, to standard setting, to policy discussion and stakeholder accountability. Lopa also is the Executive Co coordinator of uh, the Gender Equality Forum at the UN, uh, the, at, at UN Women, the Global Multi-Stake Partnership Initiative launched to accelerate the achievement of gender equality commitments. And on the occasion of, of the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action for Gender Equality, uh, Lopa has worked for well over three decades across Asia, Africa, and the, and the US and on international development, on advocacy, communication, and partnership building. She has one daughter and she lives in New York City. We also want for you to know that she is a friend of ecumenical women and she is a friend to all who are working on behalf of gender justice in our world. Uh, we will be taking questions, so get your questions ready. Use the Q&A chat feature for your questions and your comments, of course, in the chat. But please put your questions in the, in the Q&A so that we can monitor them. We're so grateful to have you. Uh, and so now, without further ado, Lopa. That thank you so, so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dion. Thank you, Victoria. Greetings to all of you wonderful, wonderful sisters, friends, comrades, fellow feminists, and fellow sojourners on this path that we are all on together. Greetings to all of you as we begin the Commission on the Status of Women on Monday. I want to start by, by, by paying tribute to all of you and sharing with you in the unendurable grief that we have all gone through this past year. We have all in our communities suffered so much loss, the loss of loved ones, the loss of livelihoods of those that we know and love and those that have that that are members of our communities, those that we serve the loss of moments with family and friends, the loss of simple pleasures of going to the movie, going on a date, the loss that we have not been alongside people in their moments of, of, of death and grief. What we have endured through this past year has been almost unendurable. And yet we have emerged through it. We have emerged through it with resilience, but most of all, we have emerged through it with belief and shared humanity and the, the enormous resilience, collaboration and partnership that has helped us to come out of this devastating year when the entire world collapsed. And coming into this new year, into 2021, we come into this year with hope, with belief in each other, belief in science, belief that we can build back better and equal 
and transport. The pandemic did not happen in a vacuum. The pandemic happened in a deeply, deeply unequal world. And the character of the pandemic is fundamentally discriminatory. It discriminates against poor, against the poor. Poor people have suffered more in the pandemic than those who are not poor. Women have suffered more in the pandemic. People of color have suffered more in the pandemic. The pandemic has not only exacerbated inequality and discrimination, it has illuminated how fundamentally flawed and unequal the world already was. And where we are at this moment, the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women as we are heading into it, the Generation Equality Forum that so many of you are engaged in, the stimulus packages that governments are rolling out everywhere, including in this country, the vaccination drive that is ongoing everywhere in all countries, the shared collaboration around vaccination that countries are engaging in to ensure that their populations uh, are able to emerge from, from this COVID, the drive to have equity in vaccination across the world. This world that is recovering from COVID, this opportunity that we now have to shift, to transform, to change, to build, build back transformed and equal. The system was broken. And all of the work that we had been doing over these years had simply been patching up a broken system because we had not been able to transform it. So this moment is an inflection point. Where, where to? from here. What have we learned over this past year? We have learned, the whole world has learned about the enormous contribution of women. As 70% of healthcare workers and frontline workers taking care of the world, but in the most fragile and insecure of jobs themselves. And women have dropped out of the economy and have suffered more job losses because their jobs were the least secure and they were the first to go. The unbearable care burden on women. Women were already doing three times as much care work as, as men before the pandemic. And that went up manifold during the pandemic, leading them also to drop out of the economy and they were locked in with their abuses during the pandemic. Violence against women and girls, which was already at a high when we started the pandemic at the beginning of 2020, uh, the Secretary General's report on Beijing plus 25 at Beijing, the review of Beijing at 25, already showed us at the beginning of 2020 that 18% of uh, women and girls between the ages of 15 and 49 years in the year past had faced intimate partner uh, uh, violence. And, and that number went up in different countries. Since COVID, that, uh, the, the, that number went up to 20, 30, and sometimes 40% in countries across, across the world, not in only one country, in France, France reported an increase of 30% of, 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 of domestic violence during the lockdown. Cyprus and Singapore helplines registered an increase in calls of 30% and 33% respectively, and so on and so on. And we know that this is only the tip of the iceberg because we know that more than 40% of women who experience violence in their, uh, in, in, in their lives do not report it. And what did this show? What did this massive acceleration of gender-based violence in COVID 
on, on an already high level, what did it show? It showed us how fragile, how ineff ineffective the systems, the services, the laws and policies that we had in place to address gender-based violence, how fragile, how ineffective they were. And so at this point in time, what should be our focus? So first, an absolute and sharp focus on ending violence against women and girls. Services to respond to and prevent violence must be deemed essential. But right now, the evidence that we have shows us that only 48 out of 135 countries have taken this step. Uh, these 135 countries came together to join the Secretary General's call on ending violence, but only 48 of them have taken any steps to address this, to make violence uh, uh, services essential. We have to ensure that women's equal representation in all COVID-19 response, decision-making and planning, driving transformative change by addressing the care economy and paid and unpaid care work, targeting women and girls in efforts to ensure that they are the recipients of, the, of, of, of socioeconomic measures that are being put in place to address COVID. But, we have evidence now that government, that social protection and jobs response of governments across the world have largely been gender blind. This is where your work lies. Your work with your networks and resources and voices and power as faith-based organizations, your reach and access is formidable in politics, in with with governments and in communities. So this brings me to this commission on the status of women. The priority theme is women's full and effective participation and decision-making in public life and the elimination of gender-based violence or violence against women and girls and achieving equality. Why are we struggling so much on this issue 25 years after Beijing? Why, when we are seeing this level of leadership that women are taking without being given the, the seats at the table, why are women struggling? Because men are resisting. Because men are resisting this shared leadership. Men are 75% of parliamentarians. They hold 73% of all managerial positions. They are 70% of climate negotiators and almost all peace negotiators. We have seen progress since Beijing. I'm, you know, I am not undermining progress that we have seen. Proportion of women in parliament has doubled since 1995. It's 25% today. But that is simply not good enough. We're still one quarter of decision-making positions and one quarter of the table. We are half of the world, half parity. That is the only acceptable way forward. In which world? Is, 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 this, this, is this acceptable? At this point in time, for most of the world, male leadership remains the norm. Just 22 countries are headed by a woman head of state or a head of government. And do you know that people in 119 countries across the world have never experienced a woman in leadership? What a dreadful loss for these populations. At the current rate of progress, gender parity will not be reached in national legislatures before 2063 or among heads of government before 2150, another 130 years away. I mean, 
this is not acceptable at any time and certainly not now when we have clear evidence that women's representation drives social progress and changes people's lives we know that women in government are more likely to advocate for investment in education in health to seek consensus and common ground we have evidence that women in office can influence gender responsive public policies and institutional practices why because they bring their lived experience to bear and we have seen in the covid response that countries that have been led by women have responded better because of their collaboration because of because they have brought to bear their lived experience as women into their leadership positions therefore at this point in time what do we need what do we need to be doing that differently what do we be, need to be doing more than we have done so that we can move forward not in incremental steps because this moment in time gives us the opportunity to take the radical change the radical urgent action so let me start the first and most important thing partnerships collaboration friends we have seen what the world has accomplished through partnership and collaboration we have been able to come up with a vaccine for this uh, uh, for this disease in record time it has never happened in the world the speed with which we now have a vaccine how has this happened because of collaboration because of belief in science in knowledge in expertise in sharing in building systems and networks across countries across regions therefore this the global pandemic shows us that collaboration works and therefore the way forward of looking at deep multi-sectoral interdisciplinary partnerships local to global international organizations partnering with local agencies with community leaders a real focus on deep wide and diverse partnerships reaching outside of your communities to partner with others because that is what what is going to make a difference number 2 support strengthen center stage feminist mobilizing we have seen what young people's intersectional mobilizing has done people of color mobilizing black lives matter in this country has is leading to policy change it's young people at the forefront we are seeing what young climate justice activists across the world democracy activists look at what is happening in myanmar it you know young women are at the forefront leading the drive for democracy believing with the belief that their shared feminist mobilizing can make change so they are putting their lives on the line because they believe that this feminist organizing is crucial for democracy and therefore going forward for you for the for the power of your networks and community to focus on feminist organizing recognizing that it is crucial to build coalitions of civil society with other political actors to bring allies on board who believe in this transformation agenda number 3 culture change much 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 deeper work than we have done so far on creating cultures of equality intersectional work looking at race looking at class looking at systems of inequality and privilege that sustain those systems and most importantly demanding demanding male allyship 
working with good men to flatten power, to redistribute and share power, to, to demand that men in power question their privilege, standing shoulder to shoulder with women and feminists and mobilizing coalitions so that we can address this culture change in far deeper and more fundamental ways than we have done so far, because we have not done enough. And that is why we are still where we are. There has to be a shift that is dramatic. The, 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 the big, big piece that we look at the focus on political will. We know that women's activism has played a critical role in supporting progressive change. But where, what we need now is that focus on political will to demand this, this, this new system change. And we have opportunities now. We have seen opportunity, uh, opportunities now. The digital platforms that have opened up for new forms of public organizing, the, the manner in which grassroots mobilization has taken place even during COVID. So we now have lessons learned from new forms of, of, of social justice mobilizing. And one of the most important aspects, which is about protecting civic space, because that is where the theater of change is going to happen. Women human rights defenders, working with women human rights defenders, working with social justice defenders at the community level to be able to support that civic space through laws and policies and ensuring that we are rolling back the discriminatory laws that that are that are that are holding uh, this in place and friends we have this moment in time now for you to join this through the generation equality forum this CSW, with its, with its absolute focus on women's leadership and participation and what we need in terms of laws and policies, effective quotas, support to feminist mobilizing, really addressing violence against women running for political office, looking at systems through which women running for political office are supported, looking at ways in which pipelines of women in corporate uh, environments are supported, addressing the intersectional ways in which supporting care work and, and putting in place social protection systems and, and public care systems will help women to be entering the, the workforce and running for, for positions of leadership. This, this ecosystem that is linked, that focus as we look at the CSW, and then for the Generation Equality Forum. The Generation Equality Forum is kicking off in Mexico at the end of this month from the, uh, 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 from the 29th to the 31st of March and will culminate in Paris from the 30th of June to the 2nd of July. The Generation Equality Forum is an intergenerational, multi-stakeholder, global movement for gender equality that is center staging this co-leadership, intergenerational leadership, this shared idea of radical imperative action for gender equality through the action coalitions and through the compact on women, peace and security and humanitarian action. We are now calling for commitments. Commitments on, for example, you, uh, you know, you, you, you were part of the, um, of the International Women's Day where we launched uh, the, 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 these actions on gender-based violence, on economic justice, on, on, uh, on feminist uh, uh, innovation and technology, on supporting feminist uh, movements and leadership, on, um, on, 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 lo on looking at bodily autonomy and, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. 
or on climate justice. And there are critical actions related to it with regard to looking at, 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 at uh, laws and policies around care, around gender-based violence, around digital inclusion. So the, this moment of looking at commitments and how you can em en energize the, the drive for commitments as your institutions, but also in the advocacy work that you're doing. Dion talked about worship as advocacy. I will say advocacy as worship, because that is uh, uh, that is is where we need to go with this collective action and collaborative action. I am going to end with some some words from uh, from my countrywoman, Arundhati Roy, whom. Uh, many of you may know as a, as, a, as, as a writer, as a public intellectual, as a feminist advocate. And she said, a new world is not simply waiting to be born. She is standing next to me, breathing. And the portal is open and we need to walk into this world together. So friends, comrades, let us look at what it is that we will do together in collaboration, in this shared action as we go forward, recognizing the imperative of action, the imperative of intersectional collaboration, and the imperative of feminist mobilizing to drive political will. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you for everything that you will be doing at the Commission on the Status of Women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lopa. I, we could not begin to thank you enough. There are so very many uh, um, of us who rely on you uh, because you are the one to tell us truth and you are the one to give us what we need. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, these uh, partnerships, these collaborations, I just wanted to begin. One, I want to also say, I have to say this because I, I want to add, as you mentioned and talked about the supporting the systems and center staging, the feminist mobilizing and how crucial it is for democracy. Also wanting to add this because we are also uh, comprised of womanist and mujerista, those of us who are activists who are working alongside these movements to create the culture change. And so I'm just wanting to thank you for acknowledging who we are um, as diverse of uh, us in it. But I wanna ask this one question and there's a few others in the chat, but what role do you see faith-based organizations playing in ending gender-based violence? So what, what is holding gender-based violence in place? Laws and policies that are not that have not supported the rolling back. You know, laws and policies, laws, let me start with laws. Laws represent what a society holds as its most cherished values. If we do not have laws that are effective in addressing gender-based violence, we cannot begin. Mm -hmm. So laws and policies, we today have discriminatory laws in place that are promoting or, or not addressing gender-based violence. That is one. Second, the focus, so rolling back discriminatory laws and, and, and supporting the creation of new laws how does that work? That works through mobilizing political work. That works through culture change. Looking at security forces, looking at services. I talked about the focus on ensuring that gender-based uh, services to end violence against women and girls are made essential. What did we see during COVID? These services were rolled back, repurposed. Women could not access shelters because there were no shelters anymore. Um, you know, they were locked in, there were no phone lines, there were hotlines which were closed down because of this. So the addressing this fragility. So what can faith-based organizations do? They can work with their political leaders. They can work with the networks that they have. They can bring resources and political advocacy to bear to one, 
look at laws and policies, two, to look at service provision very strongly, and three, to really work on shifting this culture at, 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 at a basic ground level. I want to say, on the Generation Equality Forum, you know, we on gender-based violence, the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence is looking at some critical actions. One, looking at 550 million more women and girls will live in countries with laws and policies prohibiting all forms of gender-based violence against women and girls by 2026 increase by 50% the number of countries that include more evidence-driven strategies on gender-based violence. So th these are just two, and there are more. This is where the work of faith-based organizations need to needs to focus, through commitments, but through this advocacy on driving political will to ensure that gender-based services are essential and to ensure an enabling legal and political environment and, a, and, and an enabling policy implementation environment. Over. Very, very helpful. Extremely helpful for us again, because uh, it, it, we, we saw, we see how it has affected us throughout in our local communities, as you were talking about the strengthening and partnerships, we too, uh, as faith, com faith communities, trying to bridge gaps between the local and the global, um, the multilateral um, collaborations as you are, as you are talking about. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this is very helpful. And we do have strategies. Our um, delegations have different strategies. And, and, and as it relates to strategies, we wanted to ask this question, What's, what is the best way to engage uh, as you're talking strategically, uh, what's the best way to engage the United Nations since most of the missions now are not open and we're usually able to go and to do that, mobilizing our delegations to do that from their varying countries. Uh, what, what, what are your suggestions or what are some ways that we can still engage do, while we're doing, here during Sirius W? So, you know, there are all these platforms that have been set up today. I mean, you know, all of us have learned how to mobilize digitally you know, through uh, digital platforms. And, you know, it's, it's, it's quite phenomenal. I just heard um, from uh, NGO CSW that they apparently on their platform, uh, they have registered 25,000 uh, you know, advocates. I mean, this is phenomenal. We would not have had 25,000 people physically had we been doing CSW. So, you know, this is an opportunity. Yes, we do not have right now the corridors in which, you know, conversations are taking place, but there are ways in which, you know, th uh, uh, this, this whole new mobilizing has happened through WhatsApp, through, you know, through the digital platforms, through this, you know, through this engagement that has opened up through these uh, platforms. So yes, you don't have the corridors and yes, you're not being able to engage with, with, the, uh, uh, with the delegations, the member state delegations physically, but those member state delegations are, 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 are engaging with each other virtually. So that, uh, that as this sort of new kind of, uh, you know, um, how, how would I say, you know, immediate access, if you will, that has opened up through this, you know, um, uh, ability to connect via phone, via WhatsApp, via Zoom, via, via, you know, different uh, sort of quick ways of connecting. Let's think about that and let's use that in terms of how to work during this period going forward. And then there, were, there will be the formal spaces, the formal digital spaces that have also been, uh, you know, set up and opened up uh, to, for engagement, whether those are the side events and whether those are, you know, the formal spaces at CS SW, including um, you know the general discussions and 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 the interactive dialogues and and uh, and all of the rest of it. Yes, very helpful and and it's um, also encouraging to know that even afterwards these digital spaces because this is a new 
a new way, uh, a new rhythm that we are uh, engaging. And so it's good to know that these things will continue as well. So very helpful. After the Generation Equality Forum outcome, how would uh, how will you continue? How how should we continue to engage, and um, and you and women in particular to engage the FBOs um, in the work of gender justice? So, what is the outcome of the Generation Equality Forum? It has two outcomes. One, it is this intergenerational, multi-stakeholder movement building for gender equality. The, you know, we had a briefing with the Secretary General a few days ago, and uh, if he, you know what he said? He said, for, for the UN, the Generation Equality Forum is a key priority. It is full steam ahead. Why? Because it is exemplifying the new multilateralism. This new multilateralism that is people-centered, that is looking at young women's and young people's mobilizing and this multi-stakeholder. So it's multi-stakeholder. Faith-based institutions, faith-based organizations are should be part of this multi-stakeholder movement building for gender equality. After Paris, what is Paris launching? Paris is launching a five-year time-bound action plan for gender equality based on these six action coalitions and the Women, Peace and Security and Humanitarian Compact. It's a five-year action plan, resourced, invest with investment, with monitoring, and it is a five-year investment plan that is being developed by this multi-stakeholder gathering. So the from now to Paris, faith-based institutions engage in commitments, making the commitments. After Paris, you, you are part of that movement building going forward, part of this new form of multilateralism at the United Nations, holding fast to it, ensuring that that principle of multi-stakeholder intergenerational partnership, co-leadership, co-leadership, that is one of the most phenomenal aspects of this. States, civil society, youth groups, private sector and other and UN agencies in shared leadership. This has never happened before. In shared leadership, not just in shared partnership, in shared leadership. Yes. And that is what the future of multilateralism is. And that is where your work lies. And this is also how women lead. Shared leadership is the model, and 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 you do that so well. But I want to say too, this this way, this intergenerational and multi stakeholder holder forum, and the ways in which we are moving forward together. Again, that's where our theme has come from, right? Uh, uh, going together, right? Um, I want to ask you this question, uh, and this one last question that's come up. I see it in the chat, and I think it it it, it is um, one that speaks to accountability. I know for you may not be able to answer this um, with specifics because it depends on where people are. But the question was around um, uh, how should or what should be done. Um, on the issue of young girls who have experienced that the rape and the abuse during this period of COVID-19. And so, of course, we've seen in so many countries that there's school girls that are are now the pregnancy rates have risen. Um, their 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 schoolwork has been disturbed. Um, education uh, uh, has been disrupted. Uh, and you know, so I, the question I think again is what should be done. But I would like to sort of expand it to say, what are your thoughts in terms of accountability and ways in which we could uh, mobilize towards get, um, um, seeing that achieved. So I have two responses. First, let me start with the response around the Generation Equality Forum and its accountability model. So as gender-based violence is a key action, it's one of the six uh, actions in the action coalitions. One of the action coalitions is on gender-based violence and looking at gen violence against young girls, against adolescents and against young girls is a key 
uh, goal in, in, in that and looking at it. So the actions and the commitments that will be developed at, to respond to that for, and, and put in place measures with funding for five years to address and reverse that, that accountability model, there is an accountability model being developed so that every year on year, there is reporting back on these. Remember that at this point in time, over 90 leaders have come together as uh, to be part of the action coalitions. Uh, and so and then be, there'll be many more uh, actors who will come through to make commitments. So all of these people will be joined together in an accountability model that year on year for the next five years will report on, on, on progress. Uh, uh, you know, so that shared accountability. But let me also go beyond that to say that we, uh, this is the moment in time when there has to be an absolute, uh, you know, no, you know, a complete red line, zero tolerance to uh, violence against women and girls. And let us also be clear, it is men's violence against women and girls. And therefore, the role of men as to be held to account the role of good men to work as allies. There are good men. And the role of good men to work as allies, to, to, to build this culture of zero tolerance. Uh, Dion, we in, in this, what, what, what did we do as a, as, as a world? All of us stopped going out. What did COVID do? The world stopped. The entire yes. world stopped. We changed behaviors overnight. Yes. We can do it. Mm -hmm. It requires intention and it requires political will. That's what we need for this, for, for the violence against young girls, against women and girls overall. <sighs> I tell you, I wish we could stay here all day to talk about some of these things because this is what we need. And this is why it is such an absolute um, immeasurable value when you come uh, to talk to us because this is what we need to hear so that we can take this back to our respective places, our respective countries, our respective uh, villages, our respective places to, to do this work. I just want again to thank you so very much, Lopa, for your, for your time, for your commitment, for your passion. This is one of the reasons why you're one of my sheroes because of that uh, and all that you do. And I wanna say in the spirit of collaboration, my hope is that we will see you wearing black on Thursday to be with us, to stand with us as in the global community as we call for the end of rape and violence. And so thank you again for your time and for your expertise and just for being just the beautiful human that you are. We bless you and we pray your safety um, and continued strength as you go on to Generation Equality, at the forum and everything else for the CSW. Blessings on you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dion. And I'm wearing black in anticipation yes. already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for your leadership. I stand on your shoulders and my shoulders are available for you to stand on. So thank you so much for your leadership and your friendship. Thank you. Blessings on you and to the entire you and women family. Thank you very much. So, uh, so friends, as we're continuing now, um, I, before we go into our panel discussion, I just wanted to also speak a word. There was a question that came up and we talked about wearing black on Thursdays and, and we want to honor, we do honor and respect all cultures. Um, and uh, we want to you to know there was a question about why we wear black and not another, co uh, another color. And we want to say that often black has been used in a negative connotation 
negative, negative racial connotations in particular. And so this movement, this global movement, Thursdays in Black, is one of resistance and resilience. And so we're wearing Black as a color of resistance. And resistance, as Lopa has shared with us, to the culture change that needs to happen, resisting that culture that promotes uh, violence against women and girls. So that is the reason for doing it. Um, and so now we want to just take a little stretch break before we go in to um, our panel because there's so much more for you. And so while, while you take your stretch break, get a cup of coffee, just listen to our music and we praise, we're praising in the midst of persisting. What a gift. So grateful for the Salvation Army. And um, we're so grateful for their music. You have to be in the space when the entire band is together. And we get to be able uh, to move together and in, work, in, the, in the spirit of worship. Again, I'm so grateful that for, for Lopa and for Dr. Fumsile for their uh, well wishes and greetings and for them collaborating with us coming to share with us. We hope that you uh, have been blessed by that. And I know you will be blessed by the panel discussion coming up. We want again for you to know that this is um, streaming on YouTube. It is also, um, it, it will be put up on our web, uh, our Facebook page so that it will be recorded for you to be able to use and go back to. Uh, so we thank you for joining us in this work and being an advocate with us on behalf of women and girls worldwide. As we prepare for this next panel, this is something for me I'm so excited about because my mentor and um, my hermana, both of them are on the panel as well as some of the most amazing minds and theologians as well as leaders, global leaders in the work uh, of women's, not, women's leadership in the world, women's leadership in, in, in sacred space, as well as what is considered secular space, but we know is all sacred space once we are, are, are there. Uh, we wanna, I wanna say that the panel will feature faith leaders uh, celebrating uh, women's leadership global leadership, as we mentioned, uh, on the world stage, as well as in our respective communities, but in the public sphere. Uh, they'll explore how to promote equitable sharing of authority and responsibilities in all aspects of society and support women's and girls equal access to economic and political power and decision-making bodies. We heard how important these kinds of collaborative collaborations are from LOPA. And so we are wanting to hear from these brilliant minds around the primary theme here and the review theme of this CSW. Uh, 
I am trying to, to model the speaking slowly that we're going to ask our panel to do, just as a reminder, because we have uh, interpreters that are interpreting what you say. If you're like me, we get excited about the fact that we can actually see gender justice as a reality once we all work together. So, but I would like to just say, please re be, be mindful as, as you speak, that there are interpreters um, making sure that everyone has access to hear. And so I'm gonna ask Joan Capel if she would come now. Um, Joan Capel is our secretary for ecumenical women at the United Nations. So grateful for you and for your leadership, Joan, if you would come now to introduce our moderator. Good morning. Dr. Sarah K. Dreyer is a scholar of comparative politics and human rights. Her research examines how systems of power, specifically government, legal, or religious institutions advance or undermine rights for marginalized groups. Her current book project, Church, State, and Sex, How Africa's Transnational Churches Shape Human Rights, examines the role religious institutions as sites of oppression and empowerment for women and sexual minorities. Dreyer has conducted research in East Africa, Western Europe, and the United States. She has a PhD in political science and a BA in philosophy and legal studies. Dreyer has a professional background in faith-based faith advocacy, pu public policy, research, and nonprofit human rights work. She is on the board of directors for the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, has published research commentary in the Washington Post, and is the co-director of the Oppression Resistance Research Lab at Emory University. Welcome, Dr. Dreyer. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I am honored and delighted to be joining a truly amazing and inspiring group of faith-based leaders who have dedicated their lives to equity and gender justice. So I am joined by uh, four um, luminaries. Bishop Dr. Munib Yonan is Bishop Emeritus of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land and former president of the Lutheran World Federation. He has a long history of advancing interfaith trialogue, peace, and women's ordination and empowerment. And I will um, introduce all four of the panelists um, at once and then um, pose questions to each of you. Um, after uh, Dr. Yonan, we are joined by Dr. Eva Carruthers, who is the General Secretary and CEO of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, which is an interdenominational organization within the African American faith tradition focused on justice and equity issues. And Dr. Carruthers has dedicated her career to advocacy and engagement in community development initiatives and social justice ministry, to fostering interdenominational and interfaith dialogue, and to leading study tours throughout the United States, the Caribbean, South America, and Africa. We also are joined by Ms. Meble Berengo, who has more than 15 years of education and experience in holistic development and integrated monitoring and evaluation. And she works with local Kenyan governments, communities, women, and girls to overcome gender-based vulnerabilities and barriers to education. And finally, we're joined by Dr. Teresa Delgado, who is director of the Peace and Justice Studies Program and professor and chair of the Religious Studies Department at Iona College. And her research, teaching, and mentorship addresses transform transformational pedagogies, constructive theology and ethics, and justice for racially, 
ethnically and sexually minoritized, my, minor, minorized persons. Now I'm going to begin um, the panel by posing three impossibly big questions to the panelists and inviting each of them to respond to any of these questions in um, only five minutes. So um, I apologize in advance for um, such a truncated period of time. Um, in the interest of time, I will notify you when your five minutes are up and then cut you off shortly thereafter. So our big impossible questions are first, how have you observed religious spaces functioning both as places for marginalizing women and empowering women? Second, what promising advances have you observed in the last several years for women's improved well being and empowerment? And what persisting barriers continue to stymie that progress? Third, and again, you don't have to answer all of these. Um, if you had the UN Secretary General's attention for five minutes, what one policy would you suggest he advance for gender equi equity or addressing gender-based violence? And of course, I invite each of you to respond to the ways in which the pandemic has exposed and crystallized these much broader dynamics. Now, uh, Bishop Yunin, as the former head of the Lutheran World Federation, let's begin with you to gain a perspective from Geneva and the Holy Land. And I'll, I'll you have five minutes for these opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Salam and grace to you from Jerusalem that needs your prayers for justice. Thank you for uh, this marvelous meeting, ecumenical women meeting, which I feel really at home in it and for an invitation for me to speak on women on, on, in leadership. This is a very timely theme, both for civil society and religious institutions. As an Arab Palestinian Christian, I strongly believe that God created all people in God's image, both women and men, and Jesus Christ redeemed us on the cross equally, both women and men. This means all genders have God-given rights, responsibilities, talents, and opportunity. Often I hear sometimes from the patriarchal system, we must give women their rights. My response, you are wrong. Women's rights are not ours to give or to keep or to control. They are inherent from the moment of creation. We are not making space for women because they have rights to these spaces, even though these rights have been too frequently denied. To address the persistent problem of justice, of gender injustice today, we must courageously correct the wrong beliefs and practices that have been supported and perpetuated these injustices by religion, culture, and tradition. As a religious leader from the Middle East, I say, do not use religion or the Holy Scriptures as an excuse for gender injustice. Gender justice is not a Western idea. No, it's deeply rooted in our Christian faith. Gender justice is God's given dignity to women and men. Dignity means being equal, being respected to who you are, being listened to. Dignity is defining your own destiny, being free to make your choices and being free to celebrate them. It's an attitude of respect and self-respect transforming social cultural, religious context. But this transformation is necessary throughout whole societies. As former president of LWF, having visited member churches on the six continents, I dare to say that religious institutions, churches, governments have a lot to do to bring about gender justice. As an example, a recent medical research study noted glaring lack of women in COVID-19 decision-making. They found a mere 3.5% of 115 identified COVID-19 decision-making and expert task force have gender parity in their membership, while 85% are majority men. They concluded this is not only, this, this not only reinforces inequitable power structures but undermines an effective COVID-19 response, ultimately costing lives. I would ask governments, churches, and UN 
to repeal all forms of discriminations against women and girls. This must be a top priority on our agenda as one that yearns for inclusive participatory societies. UN General Secretary uh, Guterres said, the lives of women are perhaps one of the most accurate barometers of the health of society as a whole. How society treats half of, of how society treats half of its population is a significant indication how it will treat others. Our rights are inextricably bound. I totally agree with Secretary General. I dare to ask countries who are bound to uphold you and Security Council Resolution 1325, are you walking the talk? Are you walking the talk? Now is the time to monitor and assess whether this, this resolution is actually being implemented by the member states as well as churches and religious institutions. What we ask is to achieve women's equal rights to participation and representation in every sector and at every level through ambitious actions. This means equal rights, equal responsibilities, equal pay, equal representation for every gender in every sector in society. Now is the time of, implement of implementation, not for more lofty statements. I am thankful for the strong women in my life. My late mother, Alice, my good wife, Suad, my daughters, Annalisa and Marta, as well as bishops, pastors, artists, activists, who have an impact on my life in important ways. Our world would be much poorer without their voices, past and present. Now is the time for women to reclaim their rightful space in the halls of power and seats of authority where men have governed our world for, for so long. Now is the time for women, leadership to govern our world, for I am definitely sure they will succeed where men have not. They will succeed in preventing wars and achieving justice, equality, eradicating poverty, economic growth, and harmony among nations. They will speak not about our shared security, but about our shared well-being. If I had five minutes, I would like to ask the UN, General Secretary, UN Secretary General, with whom I worked together on the document, welcoming the stranger among us in 2012, when he was the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. I'll tell him, Mr. General Secretary, do your utmost effort to ensure that your successor will be a woman to lead this organization History will remember you and other men and others when gender justice becomes a reality in our world, starting from the UN, from the governments, and in the churches. May God bless us in achieving these goals. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Yonan. Um, Dr. Carruthers, your experience bridges gender equity work in the United States, the Caribbean, South America, and Africa. What are your expert thoughts on these broad questions and dynamics? Thank you so much. Let me begin by uh, saying how humbled I am to be a part of this conversation and to the Honorable Undersecretary General and Executive Director, Dr. Fuzili, and Ms. Lopa, I just want to say, we could say amen and just go out and do the work that we have been called to do already. But I will share some reflections uh, based on the questions that you have asked me to speak to. And I speak in the context of black church diversity in the United States, where theological and sociological differences in fact shape the dynamics of black women's status within the church. Though there are many ways of documenting and substantiating liberated and liberating spaces appropriated by black women in the history of the church, it is defensible to argue that more often than not, black women have been on the margins of excluded from and or invisible in the centers of male dominated presence and power within the institutional life of the church. Further, I think we should note that even where there has been presence of black women, 
we cannot confuse presence with parity and just participation. The congregations of African-American churches are predominantly women and the pastors of African-American churches are nearly all male. Women in black churches outnumber men by more than two to one and many congregations reflect more than 75% of active participation by women. And to the contrary, of course, leadership positions are far more likely to be male. So despite increased numbers of women going into ministry and a few attaining high leadership positions, it is not without significant experiences of gender dehumanization and marginalization and quote success, often at the expense of seeking to conform to normative patriarchal values and behaviors. It is within these settings that women take on many roles, discernibly more characterized as caretakers or pseudo leaders and subservient while ignoring the real potential power that we could wield within. Um, this is not a new conversation. In 1906, Nanny Helen Burroughs cast the vision for a Women's Day, um, the week on the month for black churches. And she envisioned as a doctor, uh, Ms. Lopa has said to us, quote, a million women laboring for the coming of the kingdom in the hearts of men would be a power that would move God on his throne to answer immediately all of our petitions. However, um, her vision that was an embodiment of the spirit of Vashti and Esther, who in different ways had asserted their independence and personal agency to defy systemic oppression and violence, that was embedded in patriarchal structures was not realized. And so before she died, she reflected that quote, the day was intended to put women's feet in the path of service and lift their heads up to see the field ripe unto harvest. But now instead of showing leadership in public speaking, local church women prance up and down the aisles passing envelopes and baskets begging for money. That's Nanny Helen Burroughs in early 1900s. So unfortunately, at the intersection of race and gender, Black women often find the reinvention of patterns akin to white racism in church environments, subjecting us to double, triple jeopardy. However, that is not to say that Black women's experience with white domination, exclusion, and dehumanization is identical to what is experienced in Black institutional and social life. Further, I also acknowledge that conformity to the attitudinal and behavior norms of patriarchy are evident among and between Black women in my experience. Conformity and privilege of male leadership, dominance and authority, can often be led by other Black women who serve as gatekeepers or doorkeepers in traditional spaces. So despite the negative symbiotic relationships that are born out of male systemic domination, we have and continue to give life figuratively and literally to the Black church. From representatives of the abolitionists and women's suffrage movements, to women clubs and Garvey movement, the civil rights and black power movements, women have demonstrated promising advances which defy tradition. Such movements in the hands of black women in the US have been God's instrument of creating pages of history. With gratitude, we celebrate that we have been the beneficiaries of their legacies and the role models that embolden our very being. We celebrate these women-led movements in the US who have defied space and time and impacted and inspired women in other parts of the world. And the reverse is also true. And with the strategic use of modern technological tools, we have seen this manifested in the global age of Black Lives Matter, unleashed by the visionary actions of three women who had the courage to just say, not under our watch. And so what I witness that is promising is not only a push within the church, but an exit and a reinvention outside the brick and mortar church to find new avenues of spiritual expression and fulfillment with 
divine proclamation. If I had a five minute audience with the Secretary General, I would say much of what uh, Lopa has said. I would argue that there is a humanitarian crisis going on right now in the wealthiest nation in the world, the USA, as families in Jackson, Mississippi are facing a little over three weeks with no access to clean water and public policy on unmasking, which exacerbates the COVID-19 transmission. I would say that state fostered policies to deny participation in democracy, access to communities which are environmentally safe and transportation routes which don't foster new forms of, which are fostering new forms of Bantu scans are quietly being rolled out. And then I would say so, Secretary General, why the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women the Convention on the Rights of Children and the declarations of the human genome and human rights and human genetic data all matter. When we see this as systems of patriarchal technocracies, which have gotten more subtle, deceptive, and even sinister, which are creating landlocked communities, which literally and figuratively mitigate against women justice, we cannot breathe. I would ask how and what can the NGO civil society community do and how will you help us to amplify and ensure that the impact on UN deliberations for ethical and fair protections of women and girls against these more insidious and often hidden acts of violence that are driven by the confluence of systems that mitigate and in fact take us backwards in terms of the SDGs. What will you do to help us bring attention to those subtle ways in which our very lives are being put at risk? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carruthers for those very important and powerful reflections. Um, Ms. Berengo, you work every day with Kenyan women. What is your perspective on these global dynamics based on your intimate and on the ground work? Greetings from Nairobi and thank you very much for this opportunity to be able to speak and uh, reflect my own understanding and just um, experiences around this issue. Uh, first of all, I'll be reflecting from my background in development and experiences definitely with local communities and uh, specific interest in monitoring and evaluation. I think those who are m and development specialists will agree with me that uh, we are very practical. So a few improvements that I have witnessed or that I have observed um, over, the, over the years, number one is the legal and economic realities for women, I think, have shifted. When you think of the concept of coverture, where women were trapped in the roles of being mothers or wives um, or daughters with slim chances of either following a different path. This has shifted and has improved over the years. I have seen um, as a development practitioner when I've done home visits in rural communities that nowadays women are actually able to inherit land and they're able to stand for themselves. The second thing that I'm witnessing as a shift and a change is the increase in the number of women advocacy groups or initiatives or activism. There's this global mobilization on the issues of women. I mean, look at this meeting and the women who are leading and organizing, it's amazing. And this has really reinforced um, and brought forward issues uh, that are, that are affecting women, especially gender-based violence, uh, especially in the realm of COVID-19, where lockdowns have really affected a lot of families, conflict, violence, um, increased number of early and teenage pregnancies. I will reflect that in October last year, I was locked down in a local community. I could not go to Nairobi, which is my main city. And as a result of the increase of teenage pregnancies in the county where I was locked in, the county government, one of the representatives reached out to the Salvation Army 
and I was part of that team, we decided to do a community response in the process that brought together girls and their parents and key people who are really influential in the little villages that I was living in. And we had a process that included reflective discussions on what are the core issues that are leading to teenage pregnancies. One of the key results from that conversation was that girls felt empowered to begin to speak into their own issues. That is capacity building through conversations. But this didn't just happen. It began by a response by a county government who, a county government official who was really concerned about what was going on in the community. I think churches over the years have begun to give a lot of attention and platforms uh, for women and uh, finding opportunities to include women in leadership, but also in decision-making processes, uh, which has actually been very vibrant. The Salvation Army, for instance, has a lot of women, single women who are leaders of countries. Uh, my own leader is a single woman, Commissioner Margaret Siamoya, and she's doing an amazing work. The other aspect that I've observed is that there is a shift on how leadership is perceived. I think there's a shift uh, that leadership is not gender-based as it used to be over the years, but it's who is good at doing what? Can they do this task? And they are given that position to lead. So leadership that is based on competencies and influence and capacity and potential have begun to emerge and they are giving more platforms to women, which is something we are all advocating for. Women are more confident and they are standing up against gender-based violence. And if we look at COVID-19 lockdown effects, there are pros and there are cons. We know that women have been affected, but at the same time, I believe and have witnessed just by being locked down in a local community that women developed resilience and they, they developed their self-defense mechanism. They became more vocal on issues that were really affecting them. Another aspect that I've observed, which is probably a pro and a con, as I link to some of the barriers that are persisting to this uh, discussion we have today, is that we still have women who are not supporting other women uh, because they are still in that understanding that men are better leaders. And this could be a cultural issue, but we also have women who are really advocating uh, for more women to be in political platforms, like my, my first lady. Uh, she recently was calling out for ladies and saying, we want more ladies in government. We want more ladies to enter into politics. We want more ladies to speak on practical issues that are affecting women. Um, and I think that is really a strength even as we, we reflect about women in leadership positions and issues of gender-based violence. I think some of the persistent barriers, which I've mentioned, one of them, culture, um, that we need to do some outdated roles or traditions in some communities. But I think this can only be, be applied or this can only be enforced if women can come together and critically analyze and say these cultures are not working for our girls these cultures are not working for us as women could we find ways to deal with them and these decisions cannot be made again by women alone men need to be involved local leaders need to be involved local governments need to be involved for these aspects of culture to shift and the other aspect is that um the rate of advocacy, I, I do understand that advocacy has been going on, but I think the rate of advocacy of, uh, for women on leadership positions or uh, advocacy on gender-based violence, those messages are not going out quickly enough. We are a bit slow. I think we need to match the times and the effects and the aspects that are going on currently in relation to women. So we need to have vibrant messages. Uh, the slowness in the barrier will, will, will not help us to move where we need to go, but we need real leadership, women and leadership, we need advocacy, we need gender-based violence advocacy messages to go out fast and strong. Another issue is on perception and egoism, and I think this has been touched with my previous uh, panelists and speakers the corporate world, politics, government, and significant policy makers are still sort of like 
Amal's platform, but we must in our own platform, develop our own platform that challenge this persisting barrier if we really want to make a change. Now, if I was to meet the UN secretary and let's say I found um, I was in an elevator that is going to, you know, 60 floors. Um, one thing I would suggest and say would be the pyramid of uh, developers or people who develop policies that affect gender and issues of women, that pyramid needs to turn a little bit. I think there needs to be more local voices that are practical or even a shift each other year of fresh new ideas, fresh faces, fresh individuals who bring in practical ideas from the ground that will really help in making policies that are about women and women in leadership. So, and in the end, I would ask him, would you like, would you like me to help you in developing this new process that will enhance good results? I am available, just talk to us from the Salvation Army. Thank you very much. Thank you for your for your work and experience and perspective. Um, Dr. Delgado, you are an invaluable academic activist. Um, and I um, am turning to you to wrap up these opening remarks with your perspective as a theologian, a researcher, a teacher, and a mentor. Thank you very much, Sarah. And, uh, and thank you for, uh, for all those who organized this event. I, um, these questions are are so, uh, as you said, that they they are so uh, deep and profound, and so I can only really scratch the surface. But be, even before I do, let me first um, let me first ground my comments by a a recognition and honoring. I'm here in New York as well, and so I I want to begin by honoring the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and by honoring the sovereignty of the six nations, the Mohawk, the Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Seneca, and Tuscarora, and, and the land on which we are situated here in New York. Um, to, to the first question about um, religious spaces and how they function as uh, places of marginalization and empowerment. I'm speaking as a Roman Catholic women, woman in New York, uh, as a Puerto Rican. Um, so, as a Catholic woman, I first my first my mind first goes to the marginalization of women, um, in particular, as in the Catholic Church, as decision makers, as worship leaders. Um, as equal participants or unequal participants in the way that the tradition has been tradition, that is how, how it's been passed down. So for me, Catholicism makes my feminism problematic, but Catholicism also makes my feminism an absolute necessity. Um, and at the same time, I know that the institution, that is the formal institution, is not the only reflection of church. So church can be understood in many different ways. And women in the Catholic church have been and continue to be the creative forces around different ways of being church. This month we honor um, Teresa de Avila, my, my patron saint. And, and how she has been lauded as the one of the doctors of the church. And at the same time, um, in some way, um, her, her most radical theological thinking has been um, neutralized by institutional forces of the church that want to maintain, that want to lift her up as a model for women and yet somehow neutralize the the radical empowerment that she that her own theology could provide. So the ways in which um, women can move at the edges, at those creative edges of being church, and in, and impress upon the institution different ways of being more collaborative, more inclusive, uh, more just, more centered on accompaniment as we've been talking about here. So there are some things that I've, I've observed that are promising. Um, and, and one of them has been the ways in which faith-based organizations led by women are resisting the narrative that to be 
a, a person of faith is to follow the doctrines of the church by the letter of the law. And this has played out, it, the way that I've seen it play out most readily, most starkly, is in, in ways that impose greater restrictions on women's full participation and autonomy in their own body. As if to say that one cannot be faithful to one's tradition and be an advocate for women's autonomy, particularly when it comes to violence against women and girls. So what I see as most promising is that there is this um, emergence of women who are saying, I am a person of faith and I am critical of the institutional church in the ways that it imposes these restrictions on women and girls autonomy. So if I had five minutes with the Sec UN Secretary General, I would um, focus attention on access to sexual health education, sexuality, um, and sexual health, reproductive rights, reproductive health, reproductive justice has been the, I, 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 in, at least in my experience within the Roman Catholic tradition, the place where the most fraught um, opposition um, within and, and from the church has taken shape. So, so much of the way that religious spaces, leaders, and doctrines continue to exercise this control over women by controlling women's sexuality and reproductive autonomy, that's where I, I think the attention of the UN uh, needs to be placed. And so, um, it, both in the United States and around the world, those groups that are leading the greatest and most sustained and highly funded efforts to impose restrictions on women's and, and girls' bodily autonomy are through uh, conservative faith-based organizations. And so, the, so as if to say that uh, if you are a person of faith, this is exactly what you must believe. So I, I think that the, the UN has an opportunity to partner with those faith-based organizations that are leading the charge uh, to advocate for reproductive justice, um, advocate uh, for women's autonomy and girls' sexual autonomy uh, in ways that are consistent with their understanding of, uh, in, in my case, as a, as a Roman Catholic, uh, a gospel of, of freedom and, and liberation. Thank you, Dr. Delgado, for um, naming these, these very complicated waters that we are all um, seeking to navigate. Um, we have now prepared a few um, also impossibly broad um, and yet targeted questions um, targeted for each of our panelists. Um, I just want to note that, um, sorry, um, in um, the, our, our translators and interpreters have asked the panelists to speak a little bit more slowly. Um, and in, in honor of that, we will give each of you six minutes um, to respond to these questions. And this time I actually will interrupt you. Um, I'll interrupt you at the six minute mark and then cut you off at the seven minute mark. And I promise doing so will be harder for me and harder on me than it is on you um, because I, I just want, I'm hanging on each of your every word. Um, okay, so I will start by focusing on the power of working directly with women and girls in their local communities. So uh, returning to Ms. Barengo, what are the most effective strategies for supporting young girls' education and women's entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship at community levels? And do you personally ever encounter barriers as someone not from the communities in which you work? Thank you for, for the question. Um, I work with um, a group of young women who are in a local community, as I've mentioned, in uh, a place called Kasikeu, Kenya. 
and they they've been um, dealing with issues of teenage pregnancies, as I mentioned before. And I think one of the key strategies that has worked and still works is the use of neighborhood conversations. When I say neighborhood conversations is, I have a team of three other women that we form a facilitation team that actually has conversation with the girls and extend to having conversations in their homes with their parents and having conversation with local elders. We call it the SALT approach. Um, the SALT approach is just the behavior of a facilitation team in a local context. Now, this is really um, a powerful tool and process, but the challenge is that it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to build relationships. It takes a lot of time um, to break the barrier that enables people to, uh, to confide in you, and especially when it comes to girls. So my one main strategy that has always worked is the use of conversations, use of a facilitation team approach, and being able to interlink those conversations between the young girls, between their families and the neighborhood. Those three circles are interrelated. And the third circle that is really critical in this response and change is a circle that looks at policy changes that are related to issues of young girls and um, especially when it comes to like teenage pregnancies or vulnerability or um, early marriages. So that would be my, my response on that issue. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for staying within time. I'm, we would love to hear you talk for, for many hours, but I appreciate um, you keeping your remarks um, relatively brief. Dr. Carruthers, um, what methods for partnership between clergy and community activists have you found to be especially effective at advancing gender justice and equity? And what advice and pitfalls should advocates and or allies consider, particularly when working at that challenging intersection between gender and race. And again, um, I will interrupt you after six minutes. And as a reminder, please speak slowly for our interpreters. Thank you. Um, I, I'm appreciative of your question. And it took me back to um, my first trip to Brazil as director of the Black Theology Project and a facilitator of an ecumenical study delegation. This was before women were even granted the right to vote in Brazil. And we were especially interested in the status of women. Winnie Mandela had just left the country and a mandala was in the air. Um, and somewhere between our naivete and assumptions, we thought the answer to our question of what is your biggest challenge would be in the areas of institutional life, such as family, health, education, et cetera. But to our surprise, the women responded that their greatest challenge was the conscious and unconscious idea of beauty. That is the Imago Dei and the humanity in black female skin. It really made us pause. My point is that one important and often overlooked need to make gender justice come real is to unapologetically and transparently address the trauma, the external forces and the internal negation that is associated with, in my experience, Black female bodies. Another uh, recommendation related to that is to model the model based on a, a positive embracing of who we all are in the image of God and to create circles of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring engagement as intentional spaces for healing and support. I would also add that evidence supports that we need transgenerational impact that creates opportunities for cooperative economic enterprises where we control the marketplace and educational centers that are created and managed by the spirit of women and that that can have a phenomenal impact on any society. There are some pitfalls that come to mind as well. One is that we must avoid making black men the enemy 
as opposed to the ally and not acknowledging the interrelated and correlated kind of systemic sources of injustice that impacts the family unit. In the US, we note this week that as we held a global day of prayer for George Floyd, eight minutes and 46 seconds for his murder at the hands of police officer whose trial had begun. And this day, today in the United States is the first year anniversary of the police murder of Breonna Taylor as she slept in her bed. Black men and Black women recognize that we must be allies as we share this call for gender justice. We share the determinant factor of racism in America, but we all have to deal with the consequences of what it means to not create gender justice. This work cannot be done being a lone ranger or solo or in silos in terms of, of confronting systems of patriarchy. We have learned that we should embrace the power of motherhood, I believe, with greater intention. There is an adage in the Black community in this country that Black women tend to raise their daughters and love our boys. And I think we must have a balance between how we raise both daughters and our sons. So for such a time as this, I'm suggesting that maybe we need to reimagine have a blank page before us and ask a different set of questions to inform uh, what we understand. Um, in the Black church, I have to think of prior generations where it may be that, you know, the church was a place where you just inhaled peace be still over the requirement of exhale, exhaling, let the fight begin. Perhaps it was a place where we just came to rest and uh, the trauma was massaged and muffled by rest and respite as opposed to confrontation and resistance? And could it be that our unconscious and conscious symbolic and real desires to be protected, to be proclaimed and performed, to affirm our beauty became a dance of, of gender um, discrimination unconsciously in terms of relationships, which were kind of a psychosocial spiritual dynamic within our spaces. These are new and old questions I think we must have for visitation. But in the end, I think we have the energy represented in the diversity of this room to process all the trauma, to resist the oppressions, oppression, and to reimagine divine liberation and innovation between the rage that we may hold, but yet the hope that brings about our transformation. And to that end, I underscore the value of teaching the next generation of a reaffirming of their Pan-Africanism and the experiences that have come out of the way that people of African descent have shared the stories of generations of a living God that has been present with us despite great, great trauma. And so we celebrate the biblical narratives of Vashti and Esther and Rahab, but also Dandara in Brazil and Yasantua and Nzinga and Winnie and Wangara Matai who was well before her time around environmental justice. We celebrate Jarena Lee and Rosa Parks and Fannie Lou Hamer and Mary McLeod Bethune and Ida B. Wells Barnett as we struggle with the disparate distribution of the vaccine in the United States, as we struggle with the discriminatory violence that is given even to Black women. The unnamed Black women, though, have stepped up and defied uh, and, con and defied and confronted um, these patriarchal um, spaces and have created self-determinant spaces for our physical, our emotional, our economic, and our social survival and well-being. And so what I think is so very special about this moment here is this end gathering of women from all over the world. Our shared narratives and our lives demonstrate that whether we are in, of, or outside of the marketplace or the church, we do have the power to transform it especially through the unity of vision, of strategic planning and action. 
you couple that with a claim of our creative beauty and divinity within, and we can be co-sojourners with each other, connecting ecosystems of power and support for one another. Thursdays in Black is but one manifestation of that witness. And so I close with saying that the spirit of Vashti and Esther and Nanny Helen Burroughs and Breonna Taylor Rest and abide with us today as we continue to encourage our spirits. They hover over us today as many have and continue to confront the theological and institutional church structures that continue to deny the fullness of expression and the spirit of shared power and participation, parity and honor. May our mother guide, our mother guide, our mother guide continue to order our steps. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carruthers, for um, those powerful words and reminders of um, what this week represents um, in the United States. I wanna pick up on this idea about contestation and fighting um, opposition um, and turn to Dr. Yonin. Um, as the leader of an organization, the Lutheran World Federation, what roles can and should global organizations like the LWF play in advocating for equity issues? Um, for example, for women or other marginalized populations, particularly when there remains so much variation and disagreement among and within member churches. Um, we, you're, okay, great, you're off mute. Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah. You know, the LWF since 1984 has made, you know, a clear quota, 40% women, 40% men, and 20% youth in all its governing bodies. And we have developed together, you know, uh, what we say is gender justice policy in order, you know, to change the mindset of people, you see. It's a major milestone in the LWF efforts to assist the member churches to be to be develop creative approaches toward achieving justice and inclusive participation. We ask the 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 gender justice policy is just you know a policy which help which helps them to contextualize it in their context. I would like to give you know a case study of my church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. You know, the church has succeeded in developing a policy and methodology concerning family law that is gender justice based. It has done it in three ways. One, empowerment and advocacy. Mrs. Suad Yunan, the former chairperson of the Women's Committee writes, women's empowerment has been addressed very seriously by the leadership of the Lutheran Church in Palestine and Jordan for more than two decades, not only in the sense of giving women more positions in decision-making, but in a broader sense of devising strategies to enable them to fulfill their roles in church and society in the most effective way without being exploited. The church underwent a substantial metamorphosis and moved from essentialistics and deterministic arguments used throughout history across communities to justify women's invisibility to a more inclusive realism. For, for more than 10 years, public discussions on matter related to women's struggles to achieve equality in person status law took place between the congregations and the church women committee. It became clear that women needed to, their, to safeguard their rights under the law. Through organized workshops in Jordan and Palestinian Authority, Awareness building started and issues related to gender justice emerged such as domestic violence, child custody, inheritance irregulations, sexual harassment and abuse and honor killing. Secondly, leadership. All conclusions and recommendations of the workshops were submitted to the church. The women of our church generated the pressure for change and being the bishop, I fully supported their call for justice. The Synod appointed a committee of experts, women and men, to offer a draft to the Synod. 
the legal advisor of the church, advocate Mu'allim, uh, uh, um, prepared a, a legal draft in the Arabic language that is consistent with our theology and with the Palestinian legal system. With the legal system. Um, uh, uh, um, I, I also would, would like to say, in fact, that ELCJ and other recognized religious communities have the right to establish an ecclesiastical court for family issues which reflects our theology and works autonomously. In July 20, 2015, the Synod approved the, the new personal status law. But frankly, frankly speaking, the road to adopt this has been sometimes difficult and very painful. In some cases, this was due to an erroneous interpretation of the biblical texts. Even so, the leadership of the Women's Committee with the church leaders have together cooperated to have the church approve a personal family law that promotes gender justice in four major issues, marriage, divorce and annulment, inheritance and, adop inheritance and adoption. Being the bishop, I made it a point to appoint women and men judges to the new ecclesiastical court. This achievement is remarkable. It is the only constitution that is based on gender justice in the whole Middle East, in the churches and in the governments. So you can see how the church can be, can, can do, even if you are small in number, you can change it. Thirdly, ownership. There is a proverb in Arabic which says, failure has one parent, but success has many parents. I'm pleased to say that even those who argued and oppose this new personal family law, now own it. With the, when there is leadership and deliberative process to reach such a decision, people will follow. It's very significant that this law is owned by every member of our church and they are ready to defend the legal framework with the objective of achieving greater gender justice. Even Muslims called me, they say, can we, join your court because of gender justice. Ms. Suad Yunan writes, the Lutheran church has begun a journey of healing and wholeness for all its members, women and men, old and young, empowering them, empowering men and women for gender justice is mandatory for healthy and wholesome church and wholesome society and wholesome government, and wholesome UN, UN. I would add that when the church is prophetic, it will be an agent of healing and an agent for gender justice. Even if our church is small in number, we consider ourselves to be a yeast in the dough that one day will ferment the whole Palestinian society toward gender justice. May God bless you in your request for gender justice and pray for us in Palestine. Thank you, Dr. Yonan. Um, last but not least, um, for, first of all, I want to um, thank all of the panelists for speaking slowly. Um, and I'm sure that our interpreters appreciate that as well. Dr. Delgado, what does it mean to decolonize theology? How can doing so help reduce sexualized and gender-based violence? And how have your own experiences as a, as a Puerto Rican woman, woman, as a womanist theologian, and as a practicing Catholic, shaped your own scholarship and leadership and efforts to decolonize theology? Thank you for that question, Sarah. I, I will answer the question by lifting up the voice of a Puerto Rican novelist, a writer, Esmeralda Santiago, whose novel uh, called America's Dream, or um, in Espanol, El Sueño de América, says this, and I'll quote. Um, well, well, before I quote, let me, let me share that uh, she, she is using this novel, in my view, to make the claim that Puerto Rico is like an abused woman. 
kept by a violent partner that is the United States who offers appeasements to keep her quiet and subdued. And, uh, and now I'll quote from Santiago. Electronics typically mean he knows he's really hurt her, but chocolates always mean she deserved it. A coffee brewer for a split lip, a toaster oven for a black eye, a rocking chair for a broken rib that kept her out of work for a week, unquote. And so in, in my analysis, um, America uh, is the archetype of the battered woman. So it was my analysis of the condition of Puerto Rico as colonized as what led me to think about what a Puerto Rican decolonial theology could do to imagine a liberated and free Puerto Rico as a function of God's liberating story of love and justice. So the colonial structure that, that has kept Puerto Rico in an abused and, and battered state is the same structure that keeps women in a state of abuse, violence, inequality, and invisibility in relation to men. And so I think about it this way, that, that the church is the outward structure but the hidden blueprint of that architecture of oppression and coloniality that has, um, that has maintained the church, the hidden blueprint is theology. Because that hidden blueprint, that what we don't necessarily see on the outside, is what has created the structure. It has, uh, it has aligned where the load-bearing walls are placed. It has created the spaces where the hallways are, where the rooms are, where women can and cannot move and go within that structure. So in, in the words of Deborah Tonelli, she says, decolonized theology takes up the theological and political challenge to rethink the relationship between the center and the periphery. And to that, I would add that decolonized theology seeks to erode the center and flatten those modes of power in order to promote greater participation and access among all people. And so that freedom that is promoted by a decolonized theology is one that includes the entire community. It's not singular to women, it's, it is inclusive of the entire community. So the language of freedom the, the, just the talk of freedom that is not understood or by, um, by a decolonial freedom is really a false freedom. It says, I'm free when you are not free. That has been the structure of uh, the undergirding this, the language of freedom that we have been accustomed to in, in the modern world. But decolonial theology presupposes a radical freedom that says, I'm only free when you are freely, fully free. And that freedom is ordained by God, not by humans. Any doctrine, any religious doctrine that doesn't affirm that kind of radical freedom is a theology that must be decolonized. Thank you, um, Dr. Delgado, and um, all of you for elevating your experiences, your expertise, your perspectives, your um, your 
directions of hope and also for not um, shying away from naming some of the um, powerful systems of injustice that um, women still continue to encounter throughout the world. Um, I personally am very honored and grateful and inspired to have um, gotten to spend this time um, listening to you and learning from you. We have only a few minutes um, to open up the table for maybe a few questions um, from, from those of you calling in from all over the world. And I believe um, Dion will be monitoring and mod um, moderating those questions. Uh, we do have um, a question. I, I will hold my thanksgivings and gratitudes uh, for after. Um, the, the question came around how and what, as civil society, and we all are civil society, what can we do to ensure that there is fair protection for women and girls? Um, and then I, I just want to add the second portion of the question that came up, which was, um, and, and, and what, what, will, what will you do to help address the subtle ways in which our lives are being put at risk? So again, I know that we are ask, answering on behalf of organizations or, you know, but what suggestions do the panelists have in terms of how we would address these things? Again, I don't, I don't know who would like to go first or who would like to even attempt to ask, but I will repeat just to say as civil society, which is UN language of who we all are, um, what are some of the suggestions that you would have that we could really work, how, how we can go about actually um, ensuring or helping to ensure that there are fair protections for women and girls in our circles. And then the subtle ways in which our lives are being put at risk, what recommendations do you all have in addressing it? I'll take a stab at it, Reverend Dion. <clears throat> so I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would argue that one of the things we need to do is to be far more intentional about amplifying our voices. Um, one of the things I've tried to, to say is that there are new forms of uh, oppression, which is the weaponization of things we have taken for granted, which relate to our fundamental human rights. Weaponization by water, weaponization by the use of new technologies that impact what happens and who gets what, uh, weaponizations of the air and environmental justice. <clears throat> I think you connect that to um, systems which implicitly um, diminish our sense of self as girls and women, our sense of, of being empowered by understanding the divinity within has to be intentional in all of our conversations, preached words, taught uh, lessons in ministry classes in terms of the advocacy work so that we can amplify the consciousness for our communities to understand the ways in which they are being assaulted so that they can become stakeholders in, in our own liberation. Too often, I think we start at the wrong place, not understanding how traumatized we are in so many unconscious ways. And I think that there is therefore this spirit of Ubuntu that Teresa has just raised, that we have been ordained by God to do this work. It was phenomenal to see the young people in Palestine send to the young people in Ferguson. These are the tools of weaponization that are being used in terms of tear gas. This is what you need to do on the ground to mitigate the consequences of tear gas. So I'm saying that I think we have to default to some very basic things about how we educate and how we message in this social media rich world, the nature of what it means to experience uh, gender injustice. I think I will try to give it a stab as well. In addition, um, two comments. Number one, I think 
we need to be sensitive and deliberate in uh, diversification of, uh, especially in our approaches to this issue. We need to be aware of emerging methodologies and approaches that will help local responses to act and prevent from these issues happening. The second one is about um, being more proactive uh, in including uh, people from the local level in terms of policies that policies really need to adjust and policies from the local level need to be adapted to influence national level and at global level so the issue of diversification of methodologies and approaches that we are using and the second is inclusion of local voices in policy development else that wanted to add that these are these are great strategic ways I think tangible that we can hold on to were there any others who wanted to respond I think Bishop you wanted to respond yeah respond, sorry you know I want to respond in, in giving examples you know because I think we are living in a world which is not healthy with gender justice I think sometimes sometimes you know, in different parts of the world, even within in the Western countries, you find also inequality in, in such a thing, and you have really to fight it. For example, I read a report that the only country that has 50-50, you know, employment and, and is only Norway in the world. You know, like some Scandinavian countries, only 34%, which really have already 100 years, have had, gave the women, you know, to vote, but still, they are not not up there. So, so what I and if we take many of the countries you see in 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 in, in, in the Arab world, I think you know maybe they will sign one three two five. Maybe, but how can they change the laws? First of all, I would like to give an example from Jordan, from Jordan, just to give for a protection to understand how can we protect these. You know, there was um, at, at a certain time, you know. There was, everybody was speaking about honor killing. And honor killing was not seen as killing and murdering, you know, the, the, the women. So the women movement with some lawyers, uh, with the church in Jordan, have worked very closely in promoting and writing in newspaper, approaching the parliament, approaching the king, approaching the government, you see. And I would say, this, this strong advocacy that they have done, it has caused to change the law for honor killing in Jordan, that honor killing is killing now, and it's no more an honor killing. So we have to take case by, I cannot give you know, a blanket, you know, strategic plan or what we, we have to take case by case and to deal with case by case. Once we deal with it, we can really achieve things. Even in the in the in the UN, there are quite a lot to speak about, you see, on, on these issues. But when we take a specific case, a specific problem that is facing, then we can more succeed than giving, you know, a, a, a shopping list, you see, to say we want this and that and that and that. And that's what I've experienced, not only you know in Jordan, in various parts of the world. You can really, when you make a point to change the law and create consciousness and to make also, uh, you know, uh, to speak about these things, frankly, in the media and wherever you are, I think then we can give protection for women and girls in, in such, because the law is very important of every country and not only to have it on paper, but to implement it. Sarah, may I may I add something here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very very quickly, um, I, I I affirm what my um, fellow panelists have said, particularly around representation, political representation, representation in in institutions. But I I want us to make sure that we don't um, um, equate representation with full equality or equity. Because oftentimes, um, at least in my own experience, I have I have seen and witnessed how um, even women in in positions of power and uh, and prestige will reinscribe the same internalized ways of 
of power relationship that has been part of this overarching um, kind of male dominated patriarchal structure. And so while it looks good on paper, it really may not change the, the, the dynamics at all. So two strategies come to mind. One is to, to work for the representation, but also to value as women other ways of being in power and in relationship that does not reinscribe, particularly around race and equity. There is a lot of work still to be done around uh, empowering black, indigenous people of women of color in relation to white women because of those same reinscribed dynamics of power and privilege. Thank you, Dr. Delgado. Um, and please, um, I welcome everyone on the call to join me in thanking this inspiring panel, not only for sharing their time and insights today, but also for their lifelong work in empowering women throughout the world. Thank you very much. And um, I will turn uh, the floor back over to Reverend Dion. Dr. Dreyer, I just want to thank you for, uh, for the ways in which you navigated the panel. Thank you for honoring that and bringing your own brilliance to the panel. Uh, Mama Dr. Iva, I have to just say, so this is where I have a little bit of privilege just to start and say this, that I'm so grateful um, uh, to you and for your presence, grateful to call you mentor and grateful that you said yes to being with us today. What an honor it is to be a daughter of the Proctor Conference and to be uh, one of your many daughters in the work of justice. Uh, Bishop Yeoman, Yonin, we are so grateful for your representation and for your witness to stand with women worldwide. Thank you. Uh, our dear sister, uh, Sister Berengo, I am so grateful for your witness on the ground to show that we have leadership on the ground, mobilizing and working. And we will go with the SALT approach um, and we're taking that with us as we go, mobilizing men and local leaders, local governments, as you have said, to be involved so that we can see the change. Uh, mi hermana, Dr. Delgado, so grateful for you. So grateful that we have uh, been taught by Dr. D Dolores Williams together at Union Theological Seminary. Grateful that you said yes to be a witness to Mujerista theology today and womanist theology embodied. Thank you. And we will, as you have mentioned to us, not perpetuates the uh, patriarchal structures, but we will faithfully be faithful not only to our own traditions, but we can also be faithful in doing that to our own bodies as well. So grateful for you. And Bishop Yeoman, we will remember what you said, not to use religion to justify gender-based violence. We thank you for it. Mama Iva, we will never confuse presence with parity and participation, ashe and amen. I'm going to use this time now just to say thank you because we want to leave with worship on uh, with a, a spirit of worship. And if we were gathered in the in the church center, we would be singing siahamba right together. We would be waving flags and leaving. And so I want for us to leave this sacred space with that um, that image and that powers as we go. So. I want to say thank you. I can't call all the names because I'm going to get in trouble if I call all the names, but I do want to say thank you and acknowledge Rebecca from the, the, from the US, UCC. If it were not for you, we could not have had this gathering together. So grateful for you, Rebecca, to hold our blessing for you um, to bring us to here. And Rachel um, from the L Lutheran World Federation, thank you. The both of you have made today possible um, being our Zoom angels. Thank you. Um, interpreters, we are grateful for your, for your presence and for your ability to help us access the world and for them to be here. We're so honored to have you and so grateful that you are able to be with us. For the worship team, 
You all are magnificent. Thank you so very much, especially to you, Grace. It, it is not easy in this virtual world to put together a virtual choir and to do any of those things. And so um, to all of the worship team, those who are on the worship team today who participated, we bless God for you. For the orientation team, um, Victoria, thank you so much. Victoria, Victoria is um, the one who leads us. When Victoria says go, we say yes, ma'am. And so we thank you. So uh, for Major Major Edmonds, we bless God for you and for your life. We thank you for your witness and for helping to teach us all navigate how we navigate these UN spaces. So very grateful for you, Christine Mangali. I'm calling these two names because you all help gather this team um, for this panel and for this orientation today. All those who participated in helping us to be able to get all who were here. But Christine, thank you so much. You have always been uh, one of our griots um, to help shape us in this work. So blessings to you all. Uh, I wanna remind you that on Monday, we will have our worship meeting 4 p.m. on Monday uh, so that we uh, will be able to answer some of your questions. Use your emails, please, please, please lean on all of the um, your main representatives. And I do wanna say to the entire, all of the main, uh, our representatives around the ecumenical women's table, thank you. Thank you, thank you. If you, if it were not for you, there would be no ecumenical women. So we are grateful for you. Um, so remember, worship uh, worship meeting on Monday at 4 p.m. and on Thursday, uh, uh, March 18th at 2 p.m. Such a blessing to be able to partner with uh, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, who is one of uh, uh, our sponsors, and we are partnering with the with the UN Working Group on girls. And so that we are hearing the, the girl, the voices of our girls talk about this. Now, this is the Thursday. So what color are we wearing on Thursday? Put it in the chat. What are we wearing on Thursday? Black. We're wearing Thursday. Uh, we're, we are wearing black. Yeah. Yes. For Thursdays in black, this is our girls on fire. Um, it is an intergenerational interfaith conversation around ending gender-based violence in our lifetime. And so we want again uh, to invite you to that. It is at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard. Please navigate through your CSW, C, um, NGO CS. Uh, NGOCSW, um, the, the forums and the forum so that you can um, participate. We will also send the link and that too will be aired uh, through our YouTube channel. And then the last reminder, please turn your clocks back uh, forward today. Turn your clocks forward so that you don't miss church tomorrow and that you won't, you'll have a great start for your week. So remember to turn your clocks forward um, uh, if you're here in the States so that you will be on time. And as we go into now this space, what a gift and an honor it is to be able to, to, uh, to be the chair of ecumenical women at this time and in this season of life, in this moment. I am such, a, I'm so in awe of all of you. Thank you again to all of our panelists, to you and women for participating um, and for all of you here. We invoked the names today. We invoked their names. And as we go into this now, our closing worship, we say, we call the name again and thank you for Vashti and for Esther, remembering that it was the, 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 the palace that shifted and changed around her. It was not she who needed to shift and change, but the palace, the structures and the systems changed around her. So for such a time as this, uh, the Esthers and the Vashtis, if it were not her, if it wasn't for the Nanny Helen Burroughs, we, if it was not for Esmeralda Santiago, for the Brianna Taylors, for the Rahabs, for the Hagars, for the Debras, the Baraks, and the Jaels, we call their names. And we thank you for all of you co-sojourners, comrades, allies, siblings, 
collaborators, partners, and friends. We mobilize together to end all forms of gender-based violence and towards gender justice for all. As Mama Iva has said to us, may our mother God continue to order our steps. And remember, we will go together to the glory of God. Come all ye people, come and praise your maker. Come all ye people, come and praise your maker. Come all ye people, come and praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. We are in Moses, in the mighty Moses, in the mighty Vontade, 
assim na terra como nos céus. Pão nosso de cada dia nos dai hoje. Perdoa as nossas dívidas, assim como nós perdoamos aos nossos devedores. Não nos deixes cair em tentação, mas livra-nos do mal, pois Teu é o reino, o poder e a glória para sempre. Amém. Pai nosso que está no céu, santificado seja o Teu Pai, venha a nós o Jesus. So we have heard and felt a lot already today, and it shall only grow as the week continues. Uh, so Rev. Nikki and I are going to invite you to, instead of hearing another sermon, to see about hearing and feeling a story from our scripture in your body. Um, as we read the scripture and give you instructions, our colleague, uh, Rev. Laura Marie, is going to um, be a visual representation of the embodiment of the scripture we are asking you to do. So I ask you to take a deep breath in and exhale and take another deep breath in and exhale and open your heart and your mind to what the scripture has to say to you today. Reading from Judges 4. Verses four through 10. Now Deborah, a prophetess and the wife of Lapidoth was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went there to her tree to seek her advice. We have all been the ones to sit, to sit to receive advice and to sit when we are sharing advice with others. I invite you to think about how you sit, either when you are seeking help from others or when you are the one giving advice. I invite you to pick one of those poses, hopefully the one that feels the most open to you and continue listening to the story. One day, she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam from Kedesh in Naphtali. And she said to him, the Lord God of Israel commands you, go to Mount Tabor, bring 10,000 from the type of Naphtali and Zebulun. I will send Sisera, the general of Jabin's army to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops. And I will give him into your hand. Barak answered, if you will go with me, I will go, but I will not go unless you go with me. In Barak's words, we hear his fear and then his stubbornness, his cry and plea for accompaniment. So now as you think of his words, I will not go unless you go with me, I would like you to change your body position to either show your stubborn refusal to move or the pose your body takes when you are forced to ask for help or when you find the strength to ask for the accompaniment that you need for your journey. Deborah said to him, surely I will come with you. Whichever pose you were holding as you felt Barak's stubborn refusal or need for help, I want you to relax it into a pose, into a state of someone who feels open 
to asking for help and supported by the people accompanying them. And Deborah continued back. You do understand that if I accompany you, you will not get the glory. For the Lord will allow Sisera to die at the hand of a woman. Deborah tells Barak that the glory shall not be his. Think about how this might affect your desire to do the work. Do you still want to do the work knowing that you may not be the one who gets the credit or gets the glory? Does that leave a feeling in your stomach or in your heart or in any part of your body? Sit with that feeling a minute. And wherever those feelings land in your body, our invitation is for you to place a hand and then take a deep breath in and exhale and another deep breath in and exhale. And on the third breath in, we invite you to lift your hand and that feeling, whatever it is without judgment, up to God with your inhale and your exhale. Bar Barack agreed, and uh, so Deborah got up and went with him to Kadesh. They sent fighting men from Zebulon and Natifli to Kadesh. 10,000 warriors went up behind them, and Deborah went with them. Now, as we read the story about Deborah and Barak and the 10,000 who followed them, our invitation to you is to stand or to make yourself as tall as possible while seated and think about the people that you will lead, the people that you will follow, the people that you will teach, the people who will challenge you as you encounter the difficult truths of injustice and violence in our world. And as you sit back down, take a deep breath and I invite you to look at the gallery view on your Zoom screen. Like Deborah promised Barack, let each of us promise each other by holding out our hands with our palms facing the screen that we shall accompany each other. We shall walk shoulder to shoulder with each other and we shall lead each other and follow each other in the work ahead here for us at CSW. As we remember our call to be blessings to each other, we pull our hands to our own hearts and we reflect on the fact that God has set this work in front of us. It is God who shall have the honor and the glory. And it is God who holds us fast whenever we falter, whenever we fear, and whenever we doubt ourselves. Amen. And now, beloved of God, I invite you, while we remain on mute, and in the beautiful language that God gave you, to join us together in a responsive reading. Holy God, you call us together on this journey. Walk with us as we walk with you. Companion, you are the one with whom we break bread. You provide for us the bread we need for today. You feed us with the nourishment of Jesus. Caminhe conosco como caminhamos contigo. Divine friend, you hear us. You know us. You accompany us in our days. 
You promise that we are never alone, that we are always loved, that we are always cherished. Camina con nosotras como nosotras caminamos contigo. Leader, you inspire us to follow in your footsteps, advocating towards justice, equality, reconciliation, and peace. You encourage us to be leaders in the spheres of our lives, speaking love for every today and tomorrow. March Avenue, comme nous marchons avec vous. Savior, you are the one who heals the brokenness in our hearts, our relationships, and our world. You have given yourself freely to empower us to work towards wholeness and health. Gehen Sie mit uns, wie wir mit Ihnen gehen. Guiding light, you shine your light to help us see that you are the way, the truth, and the life. You lighten our pathways, you steady our steps, you carry our burdens, you radiate grace. Walk with us as we walk with you. Holy and triune God, You inspire us in our journey with each other and with you. Walk with us as we walk with you. Now we ask you to bless us, God of love and mystery, as we walk this CSW journey. Help us to be a blessing to those we meet. Help us to carry this blessing into the work that comes before us. For we bless you, we praise you, we delight in your presence now and forever. Amen. Amen. Marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching in the light. 